All right, so um, just recap of what we were talking about on Friday. Um, we were looking at uh, different ways to transport molecules across the lipid membrane. So we looked at um, the uh, sodium potassium uh, pump. Then we looked at uh, how to move uh, calcium. Then we talked about ABC transporters. And then we ended talking briefly about cystic fibrosis, how that is caused by a mutation in a specific ABC transporter. So we have two more transport systems to talk about, and then we're gonna get into enzymes. So let's talk about how we can transport glucose um, into our cells after we eat a meal. Uh, so glucose is the main way that we get energy um, in the world, how we generate ATP. And the way that we absorb glucose into our system, we use what's called secondary active transport. So secondary active transport. And the idea here is that to get glucose in, what we do is that we bring it in with sodium. So um, we, we have a uni, not a uniport, uh, a symport. So we have a glucose a sodium uh, symport here, right? And this brings glucose and sodium in. And it's that movement of sodium that is really powering our glucose coming in as well. So we don't use ATP here, rather we're using the concentration gradient of sodium to bring in our glucose. Well, that means we have to get rid of that sodium eventually, because if we don't get rid of the sodium in our cells, the sodium will build up on the inside of our cells and then it won't be energetically favorable to import sodium and glucose at the same time. So to get rid of that sodium, we use a sodium potassium ATPase. Here, we're actually using our ATP and we're using that ATP to pump a sodium out and we'll bring a potassium in. So that's why it's called secondary active transport. It's active transport in that we use ATP, but it's not at that actual protein. It's a secondary protein that is connected to this process, if that makes sense. Um, this process, we need to keep the concentration of sodium low. So we do that through another protein that uses ATP. And because of that low concentration of sodium, we can bring glucose in. And then once glucose is in the cell, we can use a uniport uh, to put it into the bloodstream and it can be processed by the liver and such. Um, that's why if, um, so that should be, uh, if you have diarrhea, that should be salt. Uh, and you are suffering from severe salt and water loss, really the best thing you could do is mix in some sugar or some glucose uh, with that salt and water. Because as shown here, right, the glucose is helping to bring in that sodium into the cell as well. Um, and for that symport to work, you need both glucose and sodium. So yeah, if you're suffering for uh, uh, di diarrhea, right, um, mixing some glucose with salt water um, is a good way to uh, help prevent um, salt and water loss. And in fact, like yearly deaths, once this thing was discovered and that treatment option was presented, uh, yearly deaths from like diarrhea, like dropped like four by 4 million people, right? It was like 6.4 million. Now it's like 2.4 million or something like that. Um, but yeah, any questions about secondary, secondary active transport or how we bring glucose into the cell?
If not, we'll move on. Yeah, and so the last um, transport mechanism we're going to talk about is uh, lactose permeates. And the way lactose permeates works is that um, you use a, a, the proton gradient to bring across both uh, lactose and our hydrogen ion. So this is a co-transporter. So um, bacteria, right? They don't have um, organelles. So the way they do oxidative metabolism is that they just use their, their own cell membrane instead of an organelle like we do. And so they have a proton gradient, um, which is actually being shown, shown in our picture here. So we can pump like protons out into the periplasm. That is the area between their cell membrane in the cell wall, right? That's called the periplasm, right? So we pump out hydrogens. And the way that this works, and remember, when looking at these pictures, the enzyme that will be doing the transport is buried in the membrane this whole time. That's what we're being shown here. So let's take a look at this process. So we can start at step one. And like all of our other mechanisms, there's two different forms of our enzyme. We're going to call it E1 and E2. And it's basically just talking about what side is open uh, to where. So E2 is open to the periplasm. E1 is open to the cytoplasm. So if we look at the picture here, we're actually looking at the E1 version of our protein because we are being open to the cytoplasm and we have our lactose binding there in the middle. So step one, we have hydrogen and lactose binding to our protein, right? And once we have hydrogen and lactose binding, then we can have um, a change in the conformation of our protein. So no longer are we open up on the periplasm side, we now open up on the cytoplasm side. And this arrow here is showing lactose coming off. So there's lactose. So we change conformation and we go to the E1 form, right? And so in the E1 form, we have hydrogen and lactose being bound. Well, lactose doesn't wanna to bind to the E1 form of the enzyme at all. And so it has really low affinity. So it just kind of pops right off. Once lactose pops off, our hydrogen pops off as well. And so we're left in E1. And eventually this E1 form will go back to the E2 form. That's what we mean by recovery here. We need to switch back to be open to the um, periplasm uh, form. And then once we're open up in the periplasm form, we can start this again. So E1, low affinity for lactose in the binding sites facing the cytoplasm. So that's why we let go of the lactose and the cytoplasm. E2, the binding site is facing the periplasm and it has very high affinity for our lactose. It really wants to bind. And that is another way, another mechanism showing you how to transport a molecule across the membrane. But like the other, um, methods or uh, that we've seen here, um, they're basically the same thing, right? Two different forms of an enzyme, you bind different things in different forms, you're, and you're facing or you're open in different directions in different forms, and you're bringing a molecule across the membrane, and when you do that, you switch forms. So this is about the third time we saw the same mechanism now, just for um, different molecules. But is there any questions about the transport uh, by lactose permease? All right, if not, we can move on to, um, I think I have a question here. All right, so let's see if we can actually get our understanding of how secondary active transport would work then. 
So let's say I have a bacteria sodium hydrogen antiporter. So some, some things to get down. Uh, do we have to know the E1 and E2 variations? Yes, I would like you to know the, the mechanisms that we've covered in these uh, slides. Yes. So you have a antiporter. So that's important to know what's an antiporter versus importer that uses secondary active transport. So that's what, what we just talked about. And you are excreting Na out of the cell. And you know that the outside of the cell has a higher concentration than inside the cell. All right, using that piece of information, you should be able to tell me if the extracellular pH is higher or lower than the intracellular pH. That is, where do we have a higher concentration of hydrogens? On the outside of the cell or on the inside of the cell? So take, take a minute or so to think about this and see if you can logic out like an answer. Like, I don't wanna guess. Like, if you're just gonna guess, um, don't bother with that. I want you to sit down Oh, I hope you're sitting down. I, I want you to think about those words. What does that mean? Draw a picture and see if you can logic out which must have more hydrogen ions. So I'll give you, give you a minute or two to think about that, then I'll come back with the answer. Right, so the way that you should tackle a problem like this, because I think a problem that's worded like this is super confusing to how you actually figure it out. So let's work through the, the steps of like, how do you actually like, like take in all these words and get a, a, a actual answer. So I draw my cell here, all right? So sodium's going out. If it's an antiporter, if sodium is going out, then hydrogen has to come the other way, right? So that's, that's, that's my antiporter right there. But it's saying this is secondary active transport, right? So I have another process that is either bringing sodium inside or it could be pumping hydrogen outside. I don't actually know which one that is. I don't know which direction this is going, but um, that is using ATP. So, we know that 
this is unfavorable to pump sodium out because I'm telling you that the sodium concentration is higher than inside. So the sodium concentration outside the cell is bigger than it is inside the cell. So this is our unfavorable process. It's not favorable to move um, sodium outside. So if that's the case, that means that the hydrogen component of this antiporter must be favorable because it, they can't both be unfavorable, right? Or you would probably need um, more ATP to do a process like that. So what that means is that if the pumping out of the sodium is unfavorable, then pumping in the hydrogen is probably the favorable aspect of this, this component. So if that's favorable, that means outside has a higher proton concentration than inside. And what does that mean for pH? If you have a higher concentration of protons, you have a lower pH on the outside. So the extracellular concentration, right, is, um, is higher on the outside than it is on the inside, right? And so the, the, what, let me just recap how I figured that out, right? So I know I'm pumping sodium out, it's given in the problem. And I know that the outside is higher concentration in sodium, unfavorable process. So why am I doing that process then? Well, I'm doing that process so I can bring in hydrogen because I'm exchanging one positive charge for another positive charge. So I'm, so I'm pumping out a positive charge so I can bring in a positive charge of a different ion. But that's overall not a favorable process if I'm going against concentration. So a secondary active transporter must be used um, and what that transporter is probably doing is it's probably bringing in sodium as well from the outside to the inside, or it could be pumping hydrogen back out to a different, different area of the cell. Um, that's actually not known. To, to kind of wrap your head around that, let me go back to my, uh, the example we talked about where we have our secondary active transporter here. So we have glucose and sodium coming in and we're pumping out that sodium and bringing in potassium. So we're using ATP there. So here we are bringing in, this is a symport. So glucose and sodium are coming in the same way. And we have to maintain that balance by getting sodium back out of the cell by using ATP. Here we're using not a symport, but an antiport. So sodium's actually leaving which means hydrogen's coming in. And since we're using a, a secondary active transport, what's probably happening is that um, we're using ATP to bring sodium back into the cell. Um, and, and by using that logic, we can determine, oh, that means the hydrogen that's being brought in is probably a somewhat favorable event. So, lower pH on the outside. Someone confusing, I know. Um, I probably won't ask a question that, that big brained on the test, but hopefully we can start to logic out a little bit um, how to figure these out. Like always draw a picture and start asking yourself these type of questions. You know, what does secondary active transport mean? What does an antiporter mean? If I'm, if I have an antiporter, I'm doing something unfavorable. What does that mean? Stuff like that. Higher concentration is equal to lower pH. Yes, the lower your pH, the higher your concentration of hydrogens. Yeah, the secondary active transporter is just, just there to balance out your, your first transporter, right? So 
if you're pumping out sodium, you still need sodium at some point. So your active transporter could be bringing sodium in or what could also be happening is that your hydrogen, you, you don't want to keep that in your cell like we saw with the glucose, you wanna move that somewhere else. So you need to get this, the hydrogen back out. And so you're pumping that out. That's, that's probably what's going on there at the secondary active transport phase. Yep, that, what, what this question was really getting at is to make sure you understand what an antiporter does, what is meant by secondary active transporter. That's what I'm more concerned about. Like, do you know these terms and do you know what it means? The, the secondary question there, that's really like, that's a thinker, probably something. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult question. Hard to logic out. How do you figure what the active transport is? Um, the active transport is probably, if I was to guess, probably pumping the, it, it, it's hard to say because when we were looking at the glucose example, we were talking about the lumen. So the side of the cell intaking glucose and then spitting it back out, they are facing different concentrations, right? So I don't know if the cell here has that same kind of makeup. Um, probably, I guess not, because it's bacteria. So I, that just answered my own question. This is bacteria. Um, so what, what is probably active transport is the pumping out of the hydrogen um, because what's going on, so this one is probably not it, is pumping out of the hydrogen because what's going on is that you're pumping the hydrogen outside of the cell where the hydrogen is low inside and high outside, right? So I need ATP to do that, remember, and just rereading this question, I totally just answered my own question. This, this cell, this protein, the purpose of the protein is to get rid of excess sodium from the cell. Because if you have too much sodium inside of the cell, um, that can cause problems. It really has to do with the amount of water, but anyways. So let's logic this out even more, even one step uh, further. Um, so if my purpose is to pump excess sodium out. And I do this via an, an antiporter. That's how it works. I'm breaking hydrogen inside. Then I don't want my hydrogen to build up, right? Because then my antiporter shuts down. So I need to pump the hydrogen that I took in back out. Well, I'm pumping it out into an area that has a lot of hydrogens. So to do that, I need ATP. So let's, now that I, I thought about it for a minute, the secondary active transport is most, most likely pumping out hydrogen. Does that make sense? That logic. How come you don't need ATP to pump out sodium? Because your energy is coming from bringing in hydrogen, right? because hydrogen is, that's, that's why it doesn't need ATP in the first place, is that hydrogen is coming in. And that's how we can actually figure out this whole question, right? The question is, we pump sodium out, that's unfavorable, but we don't need ATP at that specific protein. How is that possible? Well, we're bringing the hydrogen in from a place of high concentration to a place of low concentration. So that's a free exchange. We get energy from doing that, and we can spend that energy to pump the, hydro the sodium back out. This system breaks down if the inside of our cell becomes too acidic, becomes too, too many hydrogens. So we need to pump those hydrogens back out. How do we do that? Well, we have another separate protein that will do that itself through ATP. That makes sense? Let's move on to a new PowerPoint then. 
topic that usually, historically, when we talk about biochemistry, people do not like, but I like a lot. Enzymes. Okay. So the next couple of um, uh, PowerPoints are all going to deal with enzymes. And so an enzyme is a biological catalyst. So you learned about catalysts in organic chemistry too, and catalysts speed up reactions. However, when you compare the catalysts used in like organic chemistry versus enzymes, enzymes blow catalysts, uh, chemical catalysts out of the water. They are way faster. So comparing a reaction by a chemo chemical catalyst to an enzyme, the enzyme goes roughly a million to like a hundred trillion times faster. So it's way faster. Um, and it's easier to use uh, milder reaction conditions. So chemical catalysts and like organic chem, you need like super high temperatures. You need like weird pHs for this reaction to work. Enzymes work below boiling point, normal atmospheric pressure, neutral pH, right? So very, very mild. It's very specific enzymes. Uh, chemical catalysts can have a lot of side reactions. Um, when you do like an organic chemistry reaction, you're happy with like a 70% yield, right? Or if you're Walter White, you get like a 95% yield for some reason. Here though, enzymes, they like, rarely have side products. They usually do their reaction 99.9% .9 efficiently, way better than Walter White could ever hope for. And they can be regulated. So chemical catalysts can't be regulated all that well. Once they're there, they're there, they're working. Enzymes can be regulated super easily. Um, so concentration of substance, other substances, you can modify the actual protein. Um, there are just a different multitude of different ways that the cell can um, modify uh, the, the, uh, the reaction that an enzyme is taking forward. Here on my table, I'm just showing you how much faster our, our reactions go. Just some um, different enzymes like I know this one's cut off, but that's times 10 to the 14th, um, times 10 to the 12th, times 10 to the 11th, just massive, massive, massive rate increases. And I talked about this already, but anytime you see the word ACE after a protein, that usually means it's an enzyme. And enzymes for the most part are named in such a way that they'll tell you what they do. So urease breaks down urea. Alcohol dehydrogenase breaks down alcohol for uh, doing a dehydrationation reaction. Uh, not all enzymes are like this. Some are named stupid. That doesn't tell you what to do. Well, for the most part, people were smart and they named the enzyme based on what the reaction does. And we do have a systematic name to enzymes though. And there are six major classes of enzymes. So enzymes basically do only six different types of reactions. So you have your redox reaction. You have your transferases, which is transfer groups from, transfer functional groups from one molecule to another. Your hydrolases, which does hydrolysis. We talked about hydrolysis way back in chapter two. Um, remember, hydro means water. Lysis means cutting. So this is a water cutting reaction. Uh, lyase, that is you eliminate something to make a double bond. Isomerase is an isomerization reaction. If you don't remember what that means, that means rearrangement. You just rearrange functional groups on the same molecule. Um, there has been some confusion in the past. What's the difference between a transferase and an isomerase? Um, so transferase is usually between two molecules. I say two plus, but it's usually between two molecules. Uh, isomerization is one molecule. And then a ligase. A ligase is um, 
you form a bond using ATP hydrolysis. So you spend some ATP and you get a new bond. That's a lyase. And when it comes to naming, um, like I said, there's systematic names. And basically every single enzyme gets like a name like this, EC number dot, number dot, number dot, number dot, which is enzyme commission class sub, subclass, or yeah. So enzymes commission, that's the EC class, subclass, I missed one. So that should be subclass in there. Sub, subclass, and then the serial number. So any enzyme you wanna look up, it has a four digit code. Um, most people just use accepted or recommended name. Um, like I've never heard anyone talk about an enzyme with their systematic name. Usually that's only used for, you know, uh, looking in databases. If you want to look for a specific enzyme, you can look for that uh, a systematic name in a database. So our first question is more of a general question. Why do we as living organisms need enzymes at all? Why can't we just get by without an enzyme? Why do we need enzymes? Because we would use more energy faster than the rate we would make it? Maybe. There's a, there's a broader, better answer to that, I think. And it would not be fast enough. So to break down, let's say you ate a hamburger for lunch, right? Imagine you had no enzymes. There was no enzymes working on that burger. The amount of time it would take to break down that burger and like just, just not even talking about ATP hydrolysis, just like to take like one protein of that burger and to break the, um, the bonds holding it together. I want to take say it takes about 10,000 years to break like one of those bonds, right? So you would be dead before you could ever break it apart. So normally reactions in biochemistry are incredibly slow. Um, so incredibly slow that they would never happen on a time scale that's viable for life. If I shut off all of the enzymes in your body, you'd probably be dead in a matter of minutes. But um, these enzymes, we do have them to speed up reactions. So that, that's, that's the answer. The speed up reactions are too slow to sustain life. So let's see how our enzymes actually bind. So this is, this is citrate over here, and this is isocitrate. So we have two different models for how our enzymes bind their substrate. And so some vocab here, a substrate is um, what you work on. Right, it's what you're doing the chemistry on, I should say. What was the right answer? Because um, yeah, the speed up reactions are too slow to sustain life, yep. Okay, so let's, the two different models we have are induced fit model. So the induced fit model says that when a substrate binds, it binds loose to begin with. And upon binding, the enzyme will bind the substrate tighter. So um, binds loose at first, then binds tighter after a conformational change. So there's a conformational change for the enzyme then binds tighter. While the lock and key method says the substrate and enzyme bind like perfectly, like a lock fits into a key. And that's kind of what's being shown here. You can see that this binding site is like perfect 
for this enzyme, where you have a hydrophobic region to go with this substrate, hydrophobic region. You form a hydrogen bond, um, you have a hydrophobic region, and you have um, charges. So the lock and key says it already fits perfectly. No rearrangement needed. And of the two methods, the one that is probably more correct is the induced fit model. Um, in that the substrate probably binds loose at first, changes conformation, and then binds tighter. Um, that's not saying the lock and key method is completely wrong. Um, we can still use its ideas to better understand substrate binding, because when you look at these binding sites, and that's another vocab for us, binding site where substrate binds our enzyme, oops, enzyme. The binding site is shaped and does have these chemical properties to want to bind our substrate. So the binding site kind of does have a lock and key going on in that it will fit in there nicely, but it's not a perfect fit. The enzyme has to go through a conformational change and then it'll bind better. So questions about those two different um, theories of binding. And this picture in the middle is just showing that again where these different shapes are showing on the, and this green thing is your enzyme. It's just showing, hey, I can, um, I'm binding those areas. And I don't remember why I put citrate and isocitrate there off the top of my head. So although I said at the very beginning of this PowerPoint that enzymes don't have side reactions, they can bind other substrates. And that's because of the induced fit idea, right? I don't bind my substrate perfectly, which means I can bind things that kind of look like my substrate. And so when we look at enzymes, they will actually carry out reactions of related compounds. Right, and this is actually one way in which um, you know vaccines or, or 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 different drugs can work. If we want to kill bacteria, for example, um, I guess not vaccines, but if we want to kill a bacteria, for example, we can make a molecule that looks like a substrate for one of its enzymes that will bind, but not actually go through the reaction itself. And we'll talk about that um, later. That's called an inhibitor. But most enzymes do do reactions for related compounds. One example being alcohol dehydrogenase. This is a thing that breaks down alcohol when you drink it. And normally ethanol, ethanol is the stuff that you drink to uh, get drunk. That will be broken down to uh, this compound. But... Alcohol dehydrogenase can also um, break down methanol. And methanol, when broken down using this enzyme, will form formaldehyde. And um, formaldehyde will make you blind. So if you drink methanol, you're probably going to be blind, if not dead. While ethanol makes a compound that just makes you drunk. Um, isopropanol can also be broken down to acetone. Acetone is the stuff that smells funny in nail polish remover. Um, so that's just showing you, you know, that we can use this, this same enzyme breaks down things that look similar. I put it there to demonstrate stereospecificity. Yeah, I was thinking that as soon as I said that, it's like, that's what it's there for. So yeah, I made those, I made the videos you're supposed to watch about two years ago now. So thank you for paying attention to the videos more than I did. So digestive enzymes. 
show this when we look at chymotrypsin. So chymotrypsin usually works on peptide bonds, where the peptide bond is C double bond O, then nitrogen, and that gets cut. Well, chymotrypsin also works on esters, which is close, C double bond O, and it just makes a different compound. So um, this is just showing you another way in which our, our enzymes um, can be uh, not so specific. They're permissive in what, in what reactions they will do. So um, I don't need you to type this out. Just make sure you know this for the test. What's the difference between lock and key and a deuce fit? Um, we had that two slides ago. Lock and key, substrate and enzyme fits perfectly. Induce fit, substrate binds weakly, and then you have a conformational change that makes the substrate bind tighter. So I'm gonna just kind of continue on here. So when doing reactions for enzymes, a lot of the times you need what's called a cofactor for your enzyme to work. You can think of cofactor like the teeth, right? If the enzyme's your mouth, the thing that gives, gives it shape, right? The teeth are the things actually doing the work of chewing. Um, but you need the mouth there. If you just have teeth, you're not gonna chew your food very well. And if you just have a mouth without teeth, you're gonna be eating liquid food. Um, so these, these things called cofactors are, are the teeth. Um, and you have different classification of cofactors depending on what they are. You can have metal ions as your cofactor. And so a lot of things that cut DNA, they use metal ions like magnesium, uh, for example, um, is, a, is a very common cofactor for enzymes that work on DNA. If you are not metal, if you're made out of organic, you're called a coenzyme. If you bind and then unbind, uh, that's what transiently means in case you're not familiar with that word. You, that means um, that, that it only happens some of the time, right? So if you bind and unbind, that is if you're not permanent, you're called a co-substrate. If you are permanently attached to your enzyme, that's called a prosthetic group. Uh, we already looked at a prosthetic group um, in the form of heme right? Um, how oxygen binds. And I mean, hemoglobin is not really an enzyme per se, but it does have a prosthetic group in heme, and that is permanently attached to our enzyme and can't work without it. So if you're attaching something through covalent bonds, that's usually a prosthetic group. If it's non-covalent bonds, that's usually a co-substrate. And some terminology here, Hollow enzyme means you are ready to go. You have your enzyme plus substrate. Or sorry, not your enzyme and your cofactor. If you don't have your cofactor, so that's why I'm writing minus cofactor here. If you don't have your cofactor, that's called an apo enzyme. That's just your protein with no cofactor. And an enzyme without a cofactor does not work. Um, just like a mouth without teeth doesn't work very well if at all. During your reaction, your cofactor is usually changed in some way and your enzyme actually might be changed in some way. So it could use a, it could lose a group, like could lose a hydrogen, could gain an OH, somehow has changed. And what it says down here is must be regenerated to complete the cycle. So Enzymes are designed to work, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of times, right? And if your enzyme, if the cofactor of the enzymes change only once or it's changed after a reaction and you don't change it back, your enzyme is no longer usable. And so you use it for one reaction and then it's dead, which is a huge waste of energy. So when we start looking at mechanisms for enzymes, which we'll get to here shortly, uh, not today, but we'll get eventually, 
you will see at the the every single like last step of an enzyme reaction cycle is just revert back to step one, revert back to original re original form, so I can redo this reaction, so I can use my enzyme multiple times. So, is there any questions about um, any any of the information presented here? Right. So the way that enzymes actually work is through this idea of transition states and transition state theory. And the idea of transition states can be shown here in this, this example um, reaction. In this reaction, I have a molecule a and B, H, A, H, B, right? And I'm gonna combine that with another molecule, H, C. And then I'm gonna form H, A by itself. And then H, B and H, C are now connected. Somewhere during that reaction, there must have been a form where B was bound to both A and C, like bound halfway to A, and halfway to C. We call this a transition state. If this is my substrate, or my substrates, and this, these are my products, transition state is like halfway substrate, halfway product. And it's the highest energy form that exists during a reaction. So if we look at the bottom here, these are reaction coordinates. Right, that's actually what it says on the x-axis reaction coordinate. And this G, that's energy, Gibbs free energy. And on the left-hand side, we have our reactants. The right-hand side, we have our products. And here at the top, this is our transition state. This is, this is the highest energy form. So the transition state is always at the top of the mountain on these types of graphs. And the way an enzyme works, the idea behind an enzyme is that enzymes want to bind transition states. Enzymes want to bind transition states because when they bind a transition state, they lower, so this is the black part of the enzyme. By binding to a transition state really well, they lower how high of energy that transition state is. So I'll just repeat that. Enzymes want to bind the transition state because they lower the energy of the transition state, speeding up the reaction. And we can do that by understanding the math of enzymes. So the energy, the difference in energy from the reactants to the transition state, we call that delta G double dagger, right? So this symbol is weird. It's called a double dagger. And the rate of our reaction is the exponent, so E, exponent of minus delta G double dagger divided by RT, right? And so the idea is the smaller the value of uh, delta G double dagger, so the smaller this is, the faster my rate is. And so enzymes, make delta G double dagger smaller, therefore speeding up my reaction. One thing to keep in mind though, enzymes never change the free energy of a reaction, right? 
they will never make a reaction more favorable. They never change delta G. All they do is that they speed up the reaction. And by speeding up the reaction, they make equilibrium happen faster. But they never change the free energy of the reaction. All right. Any questions about those ideas? If not, this is where um, we'll end it for today since it's, oh, we do have questions. It never changes the free energy, where does the energy go? Um, so the idea of lowering the transition state barrier, um, like how to explain that? So let's say that I'm trying to lift a 200 pound weight and then my friend is in, in and I'm trying to lift it over my head, right? And my friend's an enzyme who comes over and just chops off 50 pounds of that, which makes it easier to lift. So the energy doesn't like go anywhere. It just makes it easier to do. Um, by never changing free energy. If the reaction is favorable, so here we have a favorable, this is a favorable reaction. And so that energy is usually released as heat. If it's an unfavorable reaction, you need to gain that energy from somewhere and you usually get that from ATP. Um, that's not always the case. You can use favorable energy to do other things. Like you can use that energy to pump out ions or to make ATP. So it's, it's a enzyme by enzyme answer to know what, what, what do we do with free energy? That makes sense. Energy is the ability to do work. So you're either releasing it as work or as heat. All right. Um, any other questions? So I'm not sure how else to answer that one. Okay. Um, so Wednesday, we will dive head, head first into the math. Yay, math. Um, and then we'll continue on with um, our enzyme theory. As always, I'll put a homework up so you can see that coming your way in about an hour. Otherwise, hope everybody has a good day and I will see you soon. Take care, everybody.